Regular visitors to my channel know that I love exploring old infrastructure. This time I'm looking at part of the little known Southampton to Salisbury Canal. Despite being called the Southampton to Salisbury, it never actually reached either place. It never made a profit, shut six short years after opening and was abandoned to nature. Its remains have been wreaking havoc for the last 225 odd years and in this film we're looking at what a right royal pain in the arse they've been. As usual we have my son Ross behind the camera doing loads of techie stuff and is directing this film. Ok, history lesson time. Once the industrial revolution started we needed a way to ship large quantities of raw materials and finished goods left, right and centre. The horse and cart we'd used for centuries wasn't up to the job, so the high-tech solution was these things, canals. Expensive to build, but vastly profitable. They sprung up everywhere, and in very short order we had a network of over 4,000 miles and plans for many more. The Andover Canal was opened in 1794 as part of a grand scheme to connect Manchester to Southampton. Later, two new legs were added, one leg ran from the north of Romsey to Salisbury as part of another grand scheme to link Southampton and Bristol, and the other leg ran eastwards along the River Test to Southampton. However, these two legs were built at the end of Canal Mania when investors were pulling money out of the canals and piling it into the latest get-rich-quick scheme, the railways. The canal company couldn't raise the cash to complete the scheme and folded. The Salisbury leg stopped four miles short of Salisbury and the Southampton leg opened only as far as Southampton Central Station. A tunnel was built under Marlins, but it was built on the cheap, failed its inspection and never opened. The grand schemes of connections to Bristol and Manchester were abandoned. The canal was eventually filled in and reused as a railway. Actually, the Andover Canal is pretty interesting so me and him are planning on doing a film about it later this year. Old maps show the canal between Redbridge and Marlins following the shoreline of the River Test, just metres away. So one of the big questions I had is, as you've got a river, why not use that? Why build a canal? Big ships couldn't go up the river to Redbridge as the River Test was mostly mud and canal barges couldn't go down the river as they had no power and weren't seaworthy. The solution to getting bulk goods onto the canal was to build another canal. The question should be, why did the Andover Canal choose Redbridge? The railway to Romsey uses the path of the old Andover Canal, and the route of the Southampton leg ran down Gover Road, skirted round Redbridge roundabout, and through the container port, through the cruise terminal, then along what's now the main railway line. It diverged just before the station, under Norwich House, and into a tunnel under Wyndham Court. The other part ran under God's House Tower and along the moat next to the old town walls, past Polymon Tower, through Houndwell Park and into Palmerston Park where the tunnel joined. It took a right turn along the railway line, through the gasometers and then curved to follow Millbank Street. The lock gate was about 150 metres south of the wharf. We're starting our journey at the river test end of the canal, God's House Tower. OK, so this is my famous walking backwards act. Hopefully I don't fall over. Southampton is a walled city. It was built on a peninsula and basically the reason it was built as a walled city was to protect us from invasions by the French. Now these are the old uh, city walls and this is God's House Tower. Now behind me, what you're going to see is an arch. Originally, this was a sluice gate because there's a tidal moat behind by the city walls and they actually used the tides to run a water wheel which milled corn. And when the canal came along, what they did is they basically used that for the canal. So we're at Lower Canal Walk. To my right you've got God's House Tower and to my left that building incorporates the city walls. Now just to my right was a lock. The actual rivers Test and Itchen are both tidal and the canal went between the two, so they needed a lock at both ends to keep the water in. So this is Lower Canal Walk. It actually was a towpath for the canal. 
Now the houses on the left hand side, they were built on top of a canal, but they're not the original houses. The 1933 map shows that this little lot um, was back-to-back -back terraces and you catch your glimpse of the walls between the um, buildings. During the Southampton Blitz, much of the area was flattened. Four bombs fell on Lower Canal Walk and the area known as the Ditches was pretty much completely destroyed. It was a colourful area with closely packed housing and plenty of shops. Thankfully, the walls remained intact. Now these were the defensive walls of the city and the canal ran to my right under these houses. Let's go through and walk up. That's curious. It looks like some badly bricked way into the canal or the moat. That's where the, one of the bombs fell in Southampton. This one? Yeah. Looking at the bombs falling on the canal area, the first one was on the corner of Queensway and Britain Street. Bomb 2 fell next to the Texaco garage on Queensway. Bomb 3 landed at the back of Block 2 of Palmerston House and Bomb 4 just further up Canal Walk. From East Street, the canal followed the old town walls past Polymon Tower and into Houndwell Park. OK, so we pick up outside the city walls and town ditch and the canal went along this path. So the line came through the kids' playground and across the road here. So we're in Palmerston Park and I'm heading towards this little hump in the ground. However, right beneath my feet is the entrance to the canal. That way was Southampton and that way was Northam. Although Northam was that way and the canal went through, we're not really going to cover that because there's nothing there that you can see any longer. When the canal closed, it quickly became a two mile long stagnant ditch used for fly tipping. Neither the canal company or the council had the money or motivation to fill it in, so it just got worse. In 1839, the council decided it would be a good idea to get it sorted, but as with council today, nothing happened until... Bizarre fact, someone actually managed to drown themselves right here. How is that possible? An elderly lady fell in and drowned. The council stopped farting around and applied to Parliament for the power to fill it in, but it took five more years for them to actually do anything, and even that was more an act of providence. The London to Southampton Railway was steaming its way towards Southampton docks and needed somewhere to pile all the earth and rubble they moved during construction. The council had a rather conveniently placed big hole in the ground in need of filling. So the council got their stagnant ditch filled in, at a price. The contractors charged the council four and a half pence per cubic yard for the privilege and grassing it over cost the council an extra three quid. Today, the main line comes down through Portswood, then through the tunnel to Southampton Central, but originally the line went to the docks. The railway network was expanding fast. Next stop, Dorchester, via the line known affectionately as Castleman's Corkscrew. I've cycled the remains of this from Brockenhurst to Poole, and it's one of the other films on my channel. So, to get west of Southampton, they needed to tunnel under Marlins Hill. The canal company had already built a tunnel, so why not use that? Simples. The railway engineers looked into it, but binned the idea. The bore was way too small for a double track railway, incomplete, built on the cheap and had different bore sizes at either end. Surprise, surprise, a lot of expensive work was needed to make it usable, so a new tunnel was built above the old one. And here's where the problems start. Construction started in 1845, and the residents of Above Bar, known as London Road at the time, were worried about subsidence. They'd have both tunnels only five metres below their houses. 
To keep them quiet, a series of walls were built in the old tunnel to strengthen it. In October and December 1846, there were earthfalls at the eastern end of the tunnel. Despite the strengthening walls, in April 1847, buildings in above bar started subsiding. Surveyors believed the cause was the top of the old canal tunnel giving way. Who could have predicted that happening? And in May 1847, a month before the railway opened, the biggie. The entrances to both tunnels were on similar levels. The canal tunnel had to be level, so the railway tunnel gently inclines, just clears the top of the canal tunnel by one foot and down again. Prior to the railway tunnel, when it rained, groundwater made its way downwards and out of the tunnel. All of the crap that was piled in the tunnel stopped it from escaping. It collected under the railway tunnel and saturated the clay-based soil. The canal tunnel gave way and hundred yards of the new tunnel collapsed into it. Two bystanders fell into the hole. Thankfully, they weren't hurt and walked out of the new tunnel's eastern entrance. After the collapse, the contractors wouldn't let the council surveyor into the tunnel. He was allowed in once it had been repaired and he agreed that all was fine. But just after this, a bulge in the brickwork appeared. The tunnel was sinking again. The railway opened on schedule in June 1847, but with a rail replacement coach and horses for a couple of months. The tunnel finally opened in August and apart from routine maintenance, behaved itself right up to the early 1960s. Opposite the Civic Centre, where Marlins now is, used to be the Grand Theatre stroke Hippodrome with a rose garden and fountain outside. In the name of progress, this was demolished in 1960 and replaced with Marland House, a large brutalist office block. When the foundations were being dug, the old tunnel caused problems and in March 1965, the tunnel under Marland's house was reopened to investigate subsidence. The tunnel opening was still there until 1983, when the railway tunnel was relined. The railway tunnel itself hasn't been problem free. The base of it has been constantly moving upwards. Major works to fix this happened in 1965 and 1983. In 2009, freight trains were hitting the side of the tunnel, so it was closed for a while and a new, lower concrete base was installed. Where the BBC building is used to be Edward VI Grammar School. The school moved to its current site just after the war, but the old building remained. In January 1975, something exciting happened. The tunnel subsided and the border house steps fell into it. The city engineers decided enough was enough. Let's get this sorted. The worry was that the main road around the civic centre might be next to unexpectedly fall into it. Two access shafts were dug front and back of the building, plus a few other boreholes where CCTV cameras were used to inspect the tunnel. The tunnel was pumped out, measured, inspected and photographed. What surprised the team was that the tunnel was in good condition. Lime mortar had been used, so some stalactites had grown. What really surprised them was tree roots. The tunnel was about 7.5 metres below the surface, and tree roots don't usually go much more than about two metres deep. The team wanted to find out where the tunnel ended, because nobody actually knew. They were able to pinpoint the western end of the tunnel by finding the tunnel entrance keystone under what was the Mitchell Aircraft Museum. Once the team had finished, the tunnel was filled with fly ash to prevent further subsidence. However, within two years, the Civic Centre lawn started subsiding. This is King's Bridge Lane. To my right is a BBC building, you speaking up with the six. And about here is where they dug into the tunnel. Pretty much the tunnel went straight under here. So on this patch of grass was the RJ Mitchell Aircraft Museum. Now they found the keystone somewhere around here. So we're just off Bletchenden Terrace. And this is where the Imperia building used to be. There used to be a big uh, bonded warehouse uh, owned by BAT and it was built in about 1902 and didn't live long because it was bombed in the last world war. The crosses denote where the bombs actually hit. And this represents a shoreline in the 1800s. So all of the land to my left is reclaimed.
The station is built on reclaimed land and the route of the canal was down Bletchenden Terrace and Southbrook Road. When the Southampton and Dorchester Railway Company came to choose the routes west, there was this narrow strip of land by the coastline that used to have a canal on it. The railway follows the line of the canal to the Southampton Household Recycling Centre. From there, the canal followed what used to be the coast to Redbridge, and the railway took the more direct route. So we're here at Redbridge Station. Now the line of the canal was right through the docks, just the line about there. It came right through here on this end of the platform, then goes heading that way, and then it goes through this, which is Oak Close, where I'm stumbling right now. Beneath us is the canal. And when it gets to this point, it heads down that path by the Green Gate towards the electric substation. So the actual canal path came through this substation and across this road. Follow the Green Cross Road. Then it came through here and along the corner of that block of flats. And because it didn't fill the canal in properly, guess what happened? It subsided. So this is the slip road of the M271 and it pretty much follows the path of the canal. That's a block of flats that was subsided on the corner. So this is the actual canal beneath us. The path of it was right just around the edge of Redbridge Roundabout over to my right. I think we're going to try and uh, do something naughty and cross the road. Okay, so we're bad humans. Following the path of the canal, it went straight across Adam Morey's forecourt along this bit of road here and then it went down Gover Road which we're just going to walk down. So we're walking down Gover Road now I bet most of the residents of this road don't know that underneath the road was actually the canal. Houses must have been the towpath. So this is the point where the two canals met. The railway line was built on top of the Andover Canal and Gover Road that we've just walked up goes to Southampton city centre, or at least it did. And that's the direction the canal from Andover came and joined the River Test, which at this point is tidal. This is actually called Redbridge Wharf Park, and the only way you can get to it is over the railway bridge. So it's lovely and quiet. So this crane commemorates the fact that this was a wharf. Painted in a lovely uh, sun, sun yellow, shall we say. Well, that's it for this time. I was going to look at the land reclaimed from the River Test. Spoiler alert, lots. But that topic deserves more time, so that's our next project. After that, it's probably going to be the Andover Canal, which became the Spratt and Winkle Line. Lovely name and we're hoping to film it in the summer. If you've enjoyed this film, please click subscribe for channel updates and we'll see you next time.